Um, I'm going to uh, invite Andy Hall uh, to um, uh, to bring a bit of a word to us now. Um, Andy, thank you. Good. Hello. Hello, everyone. It's uh, good to see you all again. Um, I think everybody knows me, but um, I'm up here in um, Ayrshire on the coast, bright blue sunshine. Been for a long walk along the beach today. Um, yeah, the, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what the Lord's saying about, about the situation as it currently is, and then maybe just a few things about where I think God wants us to go. Um, generally as a church, but also I felt some of this was quite specific for, for Christchurch. The first thing is, is um, that there's a verse in uh, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, and it's right at the end of all of the destruction and desolation, and, and then Israel is taken off into exile. And there's just this little half verse that says, and the land had its Sabbath rest. And uh, as I've been walking around here, there's not an aeroplane in the sky. There's hardly any cars on the road. It's uh, almost completely deserted. And there is an incredible sense of peace. Uh, it actually hits your ears. It presses on your ears, the actual peace. And uh, in a way, the Lord's brought the whole of the UK into a day of Sabbath rest. Uh, we know it's going to eventually end, but... Jesus said that, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And if God's brought the nation into a time of Sabbath rest, it's for us, it's for our blessing, it's for us to learn something, it's for us to have something worked by God in us. So the Father has plans for our blessing in this time. It's a time of Sabbath, it's a time of reflection, it's a time of blessing. I've heard several people prophetically across the world, different prophets, um, saying this is a time of reset. And uh, you know that I came late to computer games. I, I kind of missed it when I was young, so I'm not very good at them. But one of the things I've discovered very early on in, in computer games is that just when you're about to be completely annihilated and obliterated and you have no chance. You can take your finger and you can hover it over the reset button. You press the reset button and it all goes back and you suddenly have all your lives and everything is okay again. And then you can go ahead. Um, that's one way of looking at reset. But actually, I don't think that's what God's talking about when he talks about a time of reset. Um, different psychologists have different numbers they put on it but some people say 21 days some people say 40 days some people say 60 days to change a habit to break a bad one and create a new one i think in this time of sabbath rest god is pressing the reset button on all of us he's taking us totally out of our normal environment and he's trying to reset us to set new habits Habits are the things that we do uh, instinctively almost. They, they, they are our way of, of conserving energy because they're just done so naturally and so easily. We therefore assume that all our habits, especially our Christian habits, are totally pleasing to the Lord. But maybe God wants to break some of our habits. Some of the things which we've assumed for so long in comfortable, charismatic Christianity, that we've assumed well, this must be pleasing to the Lord. This must be right. And maybe God is wanting to uh, knock down some of our habits in this resetting. Resetting things in which we've put our trust instead of putting our trust actually in the Lord. Um, when I was talking to Mark the other day, the Lord gave me a picture of... of a hand crushing a Coke can. And uh, when you, if you've ever tried to crush an, an empty Coke can, actually at first it's uh, quite an easy, it, it crumples, 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 but as it gets smaller and, and more compacted, it's harder and harder. 
And I think that the hand of the Lord is on some of our structure, some of our bigness, some of our successes. And he's going and he's crumpling us down. But he knows what's at the core. And he's not crushing the core, but he is crushing some of the bigness. There, it's striking how a, a little piece of, of RNA and a little piece of DNA floating around the world has brought huge churches to a standstill, has stopped major ministries, has caused people to pack up shop and go home. And God is just maybe crushing some of the things that he wants to crush. To hope that things will go back to normal is not good enough. And the reason for that is because our previous normal was not good enough. To just say we want to go back to normal is going to miss the opportunity that God is putting before us. This is an opportunity for reset to go, as people are saying, to a new normal. But we have to be honest that our old normal wasn't actually as good as we uh, sometimes thought it was. There's a verse in the Minor Prophets, I can't remember where it is, and it talks about the people going through the valley of Achor, and Achor means trouble, and it, and it says, if you, as you go through the valley of Achor, there is a doorway of hope. And this valley that we're going through now, this valley, Acor means trouble. As we go through the valley of trouble, there's a doorway of hope. Um, don't miss the hope for opportunity to reset. Don't desire to go back to Egypt, to the way things were before. Um, we have to go through the valley of trouble to enter the door of hope. And I know that for some of us that that might just be a very physical thing. It might be to do with medical things. It might to do with COVID symptoms. And that's a, a real fearful valley of trouble that we have to go through in order to come out the other side to see God's restoration and healing. But when we talk about church, churches have to go through the valley of trouble to get to the other side too. The, the Lord will meet us in our trouble. He will sustain us in our time of trouble. He sustains us through our time of trouble. He doesn't take us out of it and drop us on the other side of it. So that means this is a Sabbath rest. It's a day. It's a time of reset. It's a valley of trouble, which God wants to make into a doorway of hope. It's incredibly optimistic that God wants to do something. That which is no longer useful to the purposes of God for the new season is being crushed and brought into the valley. The things, things have to go into the grave before they can be resurrected. Things have to go into the grave before they can rise. We can there are things that, that we've done which are great and fantastic and in their season were the cutting edge of all that God wanted. But maybe some of them now have to go into the grave. Um, some of our unfulfilled desires, some of the things we've wanted to see but haven't seen, maybe they have to go into the grave in order to become out renewed and full of resurrection power. Do we have faith? for the resurrection reset. It goes into the ground, it dies, and it comes out something different. I believe that's a word for the church in the UK, that in order to be reset, we have to embrace this valley of trouble, go into the ground, die, and be raised again. Circumstances push us into the grave. There's not much we can do about all that's going on around us. The circumstances are shoving us. It takes no faith to go into the grave, but it takes faith to come out of the grave, faith to be raised up. And that's the last bit I want to talk about is, is just having faith in these days because 
God is not just crushing us, putting us in the valley of trouble, taking us into a, a grave to say, that's it, that's you done, dusted, buried. He's taking us there because he wants to raise us. He wants to make us something incredibly different, and new and better than we've ever been before. And that requires faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. If we want to go into a new season, a new land with God, everything like that is always entered by faith. If we want to be resurrected, it is by faith. Faith based on a hope. What's your hope? Are you hopeful? The future belongs to those people who have the best hope. How hopeful are you about the future? The enemy would like us to be discouraged, disgruntled, giving up just hiding our heads. But God wants us to have hope. Hope's the launch pad upon which the rocket of faith takes off from. What's your, what are you hoping for in these days of seclusion? What are you asking God for? Let your hope rise up because your hope has to be big. Hope big. And then you will launch faith. Faith is an interesting subject, an interesting word. Um, what is faith in this sort of future faith place we're going to? Um, faith does not um, pressurise other people, particularly the vicar or the church council or somebody, you, your counsellor. Faith does not pressurise other people to provide for me, but rather it reaches out to the source of invisible provision for the new things. That faith doesn't look to people for its answer, it looks to heaven. We had a saying in Youth of the Mission, where God guides, he provides, where he leads, he feeds. Uh, it's very good for a faith mission. But faith doesn't look to the people to the left of you and to the right of you and say, will you do something for me? Faith starts saying, God, I'm expecting you to come through in the new thing that I'm believing you and I'm hoping for. Faith doesn't demand to see evidence before engagement, but understands that evidence flows from my engagement with the new. That if we're going to step out in hope and faith into the new thing, there are, we are not going to have tried and tested proofs of concept. We're not going to have blueprints and models that have been uh, worked out in some other place, put in a book and sent to us on the, um, so that we can look at it and say, look, it worked there, so it'll work here. Faith doesn't demand to see that it's already worked out, see the evidence before daring to engage, but rather it understands that if I engage, evidence will flow. If this is God, and I believe it is, then as we start to move, we will get the evidence that we are looking for, that it's worth doing. If you have to see it before you can do it or understand it, before you obey, you limit your faith to the dimension of human possibility. And God maybe wants us to move into a new dimension, spiritually, spiritually, a spiritual dimension of impossibility that he can't show us yet, but as we step into it, we will find it. Finally, on faith. Faith and fear are mutually exclusive. If I'm full of fear, it is very hard to be full of faith. Those who cannot overcome fear will not have overcoming faith. We have to look at how we feel about the news, about the statistics, about the graphs, about the future, about our church finances, about how we could possibly be a supernatural church. We have to look at that and say, am I reading the future through a lens of fear? Or am I reading the future through a lens of faith? Those that can read the future through the lens of faith will see and do the impossible. So, as I end, 
it might be that we need to repent of the fears that have been imported into our lives through watching the news by Christian media is as bad as secular media in terms of fear mongering. We might need to ask God to give us a better and bigger hope. We might need to say, God, how do you want me to step out in faith in the days ahead? Because I don't believe that we can enter into the fullness of what God has got for us unless we believe that there's a hope and a future that has come from heaven that is bigger and better than anything we've seen before. God has not given up. He, he has allowed the enemy to bring this virus as a wake up call to the church in the Western world, I believe. Uh, I believe that as we go through this time of dying, being buried, that he has a heart's desire for a resurrection that will be glorious and incredible. And that what goes into the grave can rise through faith to something extraordinary. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's uh, just allow the Lord to um, to speak to us. Just to um, just if any of that is from Him, how does He want us to to respond? Where's that fear coming in? Is there fear coming in? Does it need to be thrown out? Is there any hopelessness lingering? Is there a need to believe God? for supernatural provision, for supernatural healing. Holy Spirit, anything that's cluttering up our minds that is not the mind of Christ for this season ahead, would you begin to sift it, shake it, remove it from us? Dear Heavenly Father, we have so many things that we've, we've taken hold of. We just let go of them there. We just give them to you. And we just say, we're willing to go into your version of the future, not our version of the past, reheated for the new day. Where do you want to take us? What do you want to do? Lead us and guide us into that resurrection place by faith, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.